Paneloids Podcast. Jeremiah and Kyle. We're just kind of going to shoot from the hip with this one a little bit. It's a grab bag. Yeah, something <laughs> along those lines. And I'll think of a clickbait title later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'll start us out here. Nightwing 105. Did you see any news about this? I did not, unless it's the swimsuit cover. No. Okay. Not then talking. I do not know what's going on with Nightwing 105. All right, you and your swimsuit cover. But no, Tom Taylor said that issue 105 is going to be from Nightwing's perspective, meaning the whole extra large issue is actually going to be drawn in first person. So you're not going to see Nightwing. You're going to see what Nightwing sees. That's got to be a task for that artist bruno Bruno Redondo. i can't think of any other comic that has ever done that so i'm really excited to see how this turns out i'm definitely going to be picking up this issue for sure i'm wondering if it's going to be like uh what was that batman number was a six where the issue rotated capullo had it actually turned so you were reading the book upside down i don't think that one was advertised beforehand he wanted it to be a surprise a lot like when grant morrison did pax americana you can read the book forward and backward and it doesn't change the story at all i was skeptical of it too when someone told me and then i did it and i was like actually yeah it works perfectly forward and backward so this is obviously trying to do something special here and i'm curious if it works and if it's anything but yeah the poor artist (laughs) it's gonna be really interesting to see how he tackled this project and if it inspires anyone else i think a miles comic from first person perspective would be i don't want to use the word nauseating but definitely confusing spinning through the city and whatnot with electroshock you'd have to use some like digital focal zoom blur effects to really pull it off. Yeah. Which Nightwing does swing around a bit. I don't know if you've read any of the current run. I'm super behind. But what would you call them? Billy Clubs? They have like a literal grappling hook built into the handle. We might see a little bit of nauseating movement by Nightwing. That's for sure. A Daredevil issue that's just in radar. Hmm. They've done little bits of it. Yeah, they've done bits of it for sure. But the whole um, issue? The first time it was done was way back in the day with Gene Colan. He's the one who like really set how the radar vision is supposed to look. And a lot of people have drawn inspiration from that and pretty much every iteration of the times we see radar vision is derivative of the gene colon version but to do a whole issue like that i like the idea of like him having a conversation with someone and we're getting a clear picture of them with the radar vision but then there's just something else drawing his attention Hmm. off the panel you no longer see the person in front of him you're kind of seeing something off to the side and when he turns slightly to see what it is it's a villain or something i think that'd be really cool marvel don't steal my idea i'm sure they're going to do some kind of version of this, especially if this turns out to be something that's talked about after it's released because it's only being talked about because they're pushing it as a selling point. I'm curious. It's nice to see them doing something new. Nightwing won the Eisner last year, and so this could be mm. a good contender for best single issue um, yeah. for sure. I think it's definitely going to get looked at a little harder than just a normal issue. I kind of feel that Nightwing is the main character of the DC universe. I'm not going to get hate for it. You're the one that moderates the comments. <laughs> Dick is the best Batman. Hands down. Yeah. He's better yeah. than Bruce. I do agree that Nightwing is kind of the center of the DC universe. He's the moral center for sure. And I think he's the one that everyone kind of pins their perspective from. Mm. I mean, everyone wants to be Bruce but no one is Bruce. So being Dick is the next closest thing. And it's better anyways, because he's a better person than Bruce. Well, yeah, I kind of see him as if you took Batman and Superman and made them one character. Like it kind of merges their personality in a sense where Nightwing does do a little bit of witty and sarcasm in here and there, but it stops at that. It's not like Batman who, you're one of my children. I'm going to beat the crap out of you regardless. You're in my way. (laughs) And speaking of Batman, I don't know if you saw, I'm very tempted. I just don't have the room they're making the keaton batmobile like mcfarland's McFarlane. making it right uh-huh okay like the mcfarland keaton batmobile todd i just have yeah. a question why does <laughs> everything have to be batman related every set has a batman in it even the newest set which is all mm. speedsters the build a figure is batman is it really yeah the jay garrick the wally west the bart allen the barry allen and there's one mm-hmm. more figure and the build a figure is batman i would argue that this is not todd mcfarland's choice <laughs> I mean, the people who saw this movie when they were younger have money now. Batman definitely sells for sure. But you wouldn't open it because you're an asshole. Right. (laughs) So you just have a box. With a giant toy car in it. Yes. And then I would have the Keaton Batman also in box, maybe resting on top of it. What are McFarlane figures now? 20 bucks? 20, 25. Gold labels, I think, direct from them, I think, reach 30 occasionally. What makes a gold label? What makes it a gold label? What Um, is actually making it more money? So the gold label is 
is them going through with a fine tooth comb and popping the details more. Okay. To my knowledge, that's what gold label means. So when you see okay. the gold label Kyle Rayner, it is from the Blackest Night set, but he's the Blue mm -hmm. Lantern now. But mm -hmm. the details on the figure are better. To my mm -hmm. knowledge, that's what it means. But like no Necron, yeah, uh, tiny, that was a McFarland. Yeah, I think he was 60, but he's a deluxe. So the Swamp Thing was 60. The two pack, the Golden Blue, Booster Gold, and Ted Cord, I think was 60. So my guess, if I had to guess on the MSRP, this is going to be an 80 to a hundred dollar figure, if not hundred plus. I would not be surprised to see it at 120, but I'm thinking that it's going to be between 80 and 100. You know what would justify it? Like they did when we were children. Put a Batman with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, they can't like, do that anymore. They need you to buy the Batman separately. <laughs> it's so frustrating. I actually am very tempted on the Dark Knight McFarlane set. They look pretty nice. Now, do I need every single one of them? Oh, with the Kinda. horse builder figure? Is it a horse builder figure? Oh my God, yeah. With the Stephanie Brown Robin, the... Oh, no, oh. I'm talking about the Nolan movie trilogy oh, figure. Not... Yeah you want to do that i mean just because i don't have any of that and that's just like my favorite but like you said there's a lot of batman so it's hard to justify another purchase of another batman figure when i probably have six or seven behind me and actually that's an understatement there's literally 15 and 10 of them are batman beyond so how bad do you want a batman beyond movie like across the spider-verse mm -hmm. so i actually just made a tiktok which you know only got 250 views because that's what tiktok does to everybody now but they're probably gonna get banned so what's the difference but i made a stick to someone who was talking about, for the lack of better words, Batman Beyond's mouth hole. How <laughs> can they make his mouth correct to be live action? And the TikToker who, forgive me, I don't know, but you could go on our TikTok and find the stitch, but he was saying that he believed that's why there's no Batman Beyond live action because they can't make the mouth look right. And you either have the problem of Spider-Man Tobey Maguire where there's no emotion or emoting whatsoever, or you have something awkward that doesn't do it justice. One person in the comments said, oh, do it like vision, face paint. <laughs> Maybe not a good idea, but my idea was this. Are you familiar with the Arkham Knight from the game? Yes. Arkham City, I guess. So I was thinking kind of like a combination of that helmet and a combination of the techno costume in the Spider-Man Miles Morales video game. So if you yeah. kind of combine those two, the eyes, I don't want them to like emote, but they can go from sharp to squinting sharp. And the mouth, because the helmet is mostly glass, certain angles and lighting when you need to show the mouth, you could kind of see him talking. But when it's a fight scene that doesn't need emotion, it would be more tinted. They would use lighting to make the mouth seem visible. I like that idea. They could do something like similar to almost like Rorschach, where when he is speaking, just a mm. small amount of differential yeah. color See, change. I just, I know it's more authentic to the character just to be like that tight, almost like a symbiote is kind of how the suit attaches to him, like skin mm. tight. But I think if you're doing futuristic and you want it to be different, you need to acknowledge it more in the sense of make it look like Tron. I think that's the right way maybe like a and, cyberpunk kind of style and you'd be happy with that like you'd be happy with the yeah. tron batman beyond yeah i would and okay like i'm heavy into batman beyond so yes, yes I, I would are. say that's my preference <laughs> but to answer your question with animated i know that rumor's floating around i just don't know if it could come out the same way and this is me not talking negatively about it but the supporting cast is different you're not gonna get much comic relief from a batman beyond animated and you can't gear it towards children and have it still be that good. Now, listen, can someone do it? Probably. But I think it's a harder task to pull off. And if they really want to get it done right the first time and not just make another Bruce Wayne Batman, they need to either do animate in the sense where it's done by like some big, nasty animation company, pull like an anime studio, pull something that's really like gritty, or they have to do live action. It has to be super high budget and just go full technology blown. That's my opinion. It'll be interesting to see what they do with that. I mean, DC used mm -hmm. to wipe the floor with Marvel mm -hmm. with animated movies mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they have yeah. drastically dropped the ball. I used to love them and people still love them and still swear by them, but I haven't been a fan of the few I've seen. Maybe I'm going in the wrong direction here, but I don't even want to name them because I don't want to piss people off, but I haven't liked any of the last four or five I've seen. The last one I thought was good, which I wouldn't even rank high, was the Flashpoint one. They butchered Long Halloween. I haven't oh, given I them that a, completely. Yeah, I haven't given them a chance since Long Halloween, okay. to be honest, yeah. because because they butchered it so bad. While we're talking about all this, and I brought up the Spider-Man game, so the Venom voice actor actually leaked. We're supposed to get the Spider-Man 2 in September, which is way sooner than I thought. So that's going to be... I need to get be... a PS5. <laughs> that's what that means. 
I was about to say that's going to be most likely PS5 exclusive. And I actually refused to play the Miles one until I got a PS5. Like I waited until that because I saw so many complaints of it not running right. Ran fine for me and my PS4. I heard a lot of complaints and I get very agitated when things don't work correctly. <laughs> Those are the only two games in a very, very long time that I 100 percented on the PlayStation. I 100 percented Miles. I 100 percented the original one mm -hmm. for the Platinum trophies. Not that they matter anymore. But with this news coming out, the leak coming out, are they just going to push it back to December? Obviously, it's going to be out for mm. the holiday rush is clearly yeah. what they're talking about. Right. If I wait to get a PS5, I guarantee I can get a bundle with this thing. Oh, um, hopefully. So, yeah. If you don't have a PS5 yet, probably going to be a bundle with a cool looking yeah. fucking PS5. Do you remember Boss Logic did a markup for the Miles game and it was the sickest thing? And the problem was other people reposted and everyone fell for it. Like it was just something Boss Logic did for fun. He's too and it was good. the most beautiful thing. The controller too. And then I found out it was fake. And I'm like, because I'm getting this big white chunk of weird shaped plastic. It's going to sit in the living room. Do you think Boss Logic has made a deal with a devil if there is one? Because he's just insane. Yeah, Anything he touches looks incredible. I fact check now because of yeah. the shit like the PS5. I fact yeah. check it just to see if it's real or not. He did mm -hmm. a Chloe Barnett who was Quake in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. He did a mock-up of her as Rogue and I lost mm. my shit. Mm. And this was a few years years ago i think at this point but it looked so good yeah no uh, he's great but you brought up rogue i wanted to ask your opinion on this so jenna ortega dressed up as rogue on snl i did see that clip yes or no no all of that's out the window anyway because she's in born again and we don't know who she is and i've been speculating on it myself trying to pick up issues but i haven't had luck i've been losing a lot of auctions and i'm kind of embarrassed about it are you referring to daredevil 112 Get so, the second print. <laughs> no. <laughs> what could you see her as in Born Again since we are on the subject then? Like, where could she be? Because I think she does look young. And I think because of that, they're not going to put her as a Matt Murdock love interest. But I could be wrong, but I'm probably not. My real guess is there's some lawyer that, like, helps defend him when, like, his identity gets out and he gets arrested and all that. And I can't remember the character's name, but I thought maybe it would just be, like, a character like that. Technically, it was a love interest, but maybe they wouldn't do that. But what do you think? So the logical part... Part of my brain says Lady Bullseye, of course. She kind of fits the bill for the look. She kind of fits the bill for the seriousness. We don't know what the storyline's actually going to be. It's not going to actually be born again. My two hot takes. How about baby Matt? And she is his mother. She's Mary. Before Mary gives him up and she goes and joins the covenant. That and is then, very interesting. So yeah, you get to see like baby Matt with his mom. Because in Born Again, he reconnects with his mother. And so that could be a scene where we get the older version of his mother after he gets the shit kicked out of him and they nurse him back to health essentially and he figures out that that's his mom and then it's a flashback episode with her being married. Didn't that um, happen though or am I wrong? It was with his weren't dad. They, but no, but weren't they alluding that one of the nuns that helped nurse him back in the last season on Netflix, weren't they alluding that it could have been his mother? But it wasn't. They were alluding she that she knew his mother. Right, okay. They weren't alluding that that was Mary, they were alluding that she knew knew Mary directly. That's a good one. Probably the most likely, but you don't think Typhoid Mary? You don't think that's a... Typhoid Mary is another possibility because we've got... That's Kingpin. a love interest. Mm, yes, it is, but also like she's brutal to him in terms okay. of what she put him through in the comics for multiple years. So even when it comes to being a love interest, he hasn't been a love interest that long, so they can completely bypass that storyline. Mm -hmm. Vanessa has been recast, so the mm -hmm. Kingpin relationship with Typhoid would definitely be more business than personal if she is typhoid. But if I had my way, like number one choice of what she'd play, Kristen McDuffie. And this character is... Yeah. Well, the love interest, but also the DA for Volume 3 of Daredevil. Let's go with him in Volume 4 and 5. She's one of the few people that remembers his secret identity and she was also created by Mark Wade and Paula Rivera, so hopefully they get paid. But they don't have to go the love interest route by just having her be the DA. She can be the DA hunting him. Mm. News gets out that the devil's back in town. Down. Everyone's got to crack down. You got Detective Cole. You've got the DA, Kristen McDuffie. The fact that they didn't bring back Foggy has me infuriated. Foggy's more important to me than Stick. In the last episode, we mentioned this, but I kind of wanted to hear what you say too about it. But with Zadarsky's run ending, I'm not saying it's ending because of this, but let's just say the new beginning is going to be influenced by all of this. And what I mean is that Born Again supporting cast is going to look a lot like the next 
number one from whatever creative team we get. Therefore, the next number one's not going to have Foggy or Karen <laughs> as his supporting cast. They're not really in the Zdarsky run at all. Well, Karen's no. dead, and Foggy oh, has right. only be. been around for three issues, and they weren't even in this value, I don't think. Okay, so that helps me then. So who do you see from the current run possibly carrying over? Like, who do you think is going to be his supporting cast in Born Again? Detective Cole. Okay. I think they're going to bring Detective Cole in, so grab your Daredevil issue number twos from Volume 6. I don't want to see Electra because I didn't like the Netflix version of Electra. And no, before either. people say that Jenny Ortega is Electra, shut the fuck up. <laughs> no. But I mean, from the Zdarsky run, Detective Cole, Kristen McDuffie can work because she's also in the run a bit. But he has to do a lot of growing to get to that point. The crux of Volume 6 is he accidentally murders someone. And so that's hmm. the big storyline of he's trying to fix it, essentially. And you can't fix something like that. And he only digs this hole deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's one of the best things about Daredevil is because he fights personal battles on a public and physical scale, which is one of the reasons that I love him. But yeah, if I had to put my money on anyone coming from Volume 6 or the Zdarsky run, we're going to get Detective Cole. I don't want to see the fist. I think the storyline is great right now in the comics. I love Zdarsky's run. I put it up there with Wade's. It's sad that it's coming to an end so soon. It definitely feels rushed, the announcement. I'm sure that they're going to spin it really well and they're going to end it really, really well. I do think that it's rushed due to the announcement. I think you're right on point that it's going to be more in line with Born Again or their mm. version of Born Again. What if Karen is dead? Oh. Just coming into Born Again, Karen's already dead. Then that would make me look like an asshole because I'm just trying to say like, oh, Marvel's just trying to match the TV show. Well, they always do but that. If, right, oh, but 100. if they're actually trying to stay true, like what if they're actually matching the show to the comics? And you're right, Karen would be dead going into it and Foggy blames Matt and that's why he don't talk to him anymore. Yeah, doesn't want anything to do with him. I don't hate it and it leaves window for at least Foggy to come back. Mm -hmm. So let me now really throw a wrench into everything. What if Jenna Ortega is not Electra, but she is Daredevil? Oh, the Daredevil version of Electra? What if they just say, hey, cool costume. <laughs> and they throw it on Jenna Ortega as a brand new fresh character or just grab some name from his history of some female and make that be the Daredevil. What if she's a Kara? Don't know who that is. Low scale Daredevil villain, but he's in full garb. You can't tell it's a he. Having the spin being it's a female would be great. It'd be fine. It's one of my favorite like moments in a Daredevil comic ever. They're trying to replicate Daredevil's powers with prisoners and a car is coming after Matt. So Matt goes into a sporting goods store and he's like if this guy's got the same powers as me rain is gonna fuck with him because it took me so long to get rain down he's got uh, these brand new powers rain's gonna totally fuck his day up and so he right. hits the sprinklers and akara like stops he's got him sensory overload i'm gonna kick his ass now we're good and he goes to reach for a bat and akara turns his head and says grab the red one." Oh, because so meaning see. he could see the whole time it was the powers oh my see. god oh this my sounds god. super familiar i've either read it or you've told it to me before you've definitely read it because you've read volume three of daredevil but that moment oh it's wade oh my, okay yeah it's wade and same knee but my okay. god when i read that the first time i was working at a comic book store i'd put the book down and i went outside like i was just, you didn't throw it you just i've throw only things. thrown two comics out of anchor <laughs> Okay. I'm very curious to see what they do. And obviously there's a fear that it's not going to be dark enough or R-rated enough. But I don't want it to be. The Miller run is great, but so is the Wade run. Zdarsky run isn't that dark. Mm. I mean, it's getting dark now, but his first <laughs> run with it was a little uplifting, a little fun. Daredevil can be fun. We saw She-Hulk. It was great. A lot of people don't think that. What costume do you think <laughs> he's going to have? I want him to go back to red. I'd be okay with black. As much as I love the yellow costume, it is my favorite costume costume of all time. I don't want him in the yellow costume. I, I don't do. believe it works on screen. I don't believe it works for a tone of his own show. That's fair. I honestly think no yellow costume works on screen well because they end up just looking dirty. And the same goes with white clothing. I think the CW has ruined that for me. We'll don't see work. in Deadpool 3. Oh, yeah. No, I think they're going to go a variation of brown and black with hints of blue. I don't think they're going to give us a real full costume on Wolverine. I don't they, think should. So. they should. They earned it. Maybe a little more armored looking would fix it, but when they do like a cloth of those colors, it just doesn't work well. That's my opinion. Anyway, I wanted you to talk about something that you've mentioned to me and I don't know what it is. I got very excited when I saw this. So we're going to back up two years. So 
two years. For those who are unaware, there are something called comic pedigrees. And what a pedigree is, it's a legacy of where a collection came from, how the collection was acquired, the story behind the collection itself. And the most famous one is the Mile High Collection. Church's collection found in Denver, Colorado, is easily the greatest comic collection that has ever been found. The Promise Collection kind of is a close rival to that. So the Promise Collection was discovered two years ago. And the story behind it is two brothers. One was going off to war, World War II. And he told his little brother, take care of my comics. I'm going to want them when I come back. He never came back. But little brother continued to buy the books and store them and keep them in the most protective way possible. So you've got these golden age books that are in insane grades. And they were all graded by CGC. They all got that beautiful gold pedigree label. And so this was two years ago that this collection dropped. And some of the books were record high, huge sellers. And some of those same sellers have made it back onto Heritage two years later. And I think this is going to be a real test of the market. And the one book that I'm paying the most attention to specifically is Detective Comics 140. It is the first Golden Age appearance of the Riddler Mm. in a CGC 9.6 from 1940. Seven. How much do you think it sold last time it was on Heritage? I mean, what's a Batman first appearance go for? Batman like first just, appearance is a couple million. I mean, this is not his main villain, right? But it's in the top five, arguably. Yeah, could be top if you three. start listing Batman villains, he's going to be within the top five, probably. If I had a guess, I'd probably say 300,000. So it sold for 480,000 before buyer's wow. premium. With buyer's premium, that was 570,000 thousand dollars for this one book it is back on heritage for eight more days as the time of recording this and is currently sitting at one hundred and ten thousand in a 9.6 so mm. this is going to be a real test to see how the market but, uh-huh. obviously we had covid bring everything up and everything's kind of starting to level out but with books mm-hmm. of this caliber it's just impossible the so three other notables that i want to mention there's a detective comics 114 that is a double cover graded at a 9.8 the outside cover is graded at a 9.6 the inside cover is graded at a 9.8. CGC always displays the higher graded number on the outside of the book on the flip. It's a Joker cover and it is a black cover. It is classic golden age cover. It's beautiful. As hmm. of right now, it's sitting at 35,000. I believe the last time it sold, it sold for 180,000. The last two books I want to mention is Avon's Eerie number one, graded at a 9.2. This is the first ever horror comic that was ever released in the United States. I love you, Bill Gaines, but you did not release the first horror comic. This was the first horror comic. Avon released it in 1947. Right now, it's currently sitting at 22,000. I think the last time it sold around 70,000. Beautiful classic book. And then the one that I wasn't 100% sure of, I wanted to double check it. We got Mask Comics number one from Rule Publications. This is a beautiful LB Cole cover. When you hear of LB Cole, it's the one cover that you think of, like, for example. Oh, we are walking away from our microphone and getting a book. Okay. LB Cole book, like this is the cover. It is a classic Golden Age cover. It is insane to get it in good shape. Rule Publications had terrible quality control. These books would fall apart in your fingers. Mm. And this one is graded at an 8.5. It is the highest graded non-restored. There's three restored higher, two 9.6s, one 9.4. This is an 8.5 untouched. And this tells you how good this kid took care of his collection because this book literally just falls apart in your hands. Eight days left to go. It's at 24,000. I don't believe this one sold last time. Some Promise Collection books were sold privately. I think this is the first time it's been on Heritage. I could be completely wrong there. I could have not been paying attention to it. The day the Promise Collection dropped on Heritage, I ended up in the hospital. (laughs) So I may have missed how this one ended, but go and look. Track them. They're fun to track. Every morning I wake up to a beautiful email to show me books that I'll never be able to afford and (laughs) what price they're at currently at Heritage. But yeah, just the Promise Collection is an amazing collection. Look into pedigrees. If you're an older collector like I am, it's a really, really fun part of the hobby just to get the history of where this book came from. And if you're a newer collector, it's never going to happen for you. So two questions with that. When CGC throws the pedigree extra little shiny tag on it, does that do anything with the review process for the grade? Do they give it any kind of more allowances to give it a higher grade? I do not speak for CGC, but I believe that they would. And here is my reason why, because I've had... But up front, personal, they don't. I've had personal experience with it. Okay. So... 
uh, when I was working for a comic book store, we got a book in incredible condition, but it had a two inch spine tear. At the top of the book, it tore all the way down to the first table, just the cover. Other than that, this book was next to perfect. It was a Green Hornet number two from 1941. I submitted to CGC, not expecting anything. I was expecting it to come back 775 because that two inch tear is a big deal. It came back a 90 because hmm. it belonged to Edgar Church. It was part of the Mile High collection. So not only do I think they grade a lot lighter when it comes to pedigree books, but there's sometimes reasons why. For example, mm. Edgar would tear the book if he didn't want to look through it again. Edgar Church never read his comics. He used them as reference material for his artwork. So he would buy every comic that came out. He'd flip through it to see if there was anything he could use as reference. If he could, he'd set it aside. If he couldn't, he'd tear it and put it off to a different pile. So that kind of so makes sense. It's almost like a signature in a sense. In a sense, yes. So if they ignore or that, sure, that book was a 9 all day. But if they're going to grade it just as is, right. now your question to me should be, how'd they know it was Edgar's? One, the Green Hornet number two was missing from the catalog. Mm. Two, that two-inch spine tear. And three, there was a small notation on the inside of the first page. It was like a pencil mark that is synonymous with all other Mile High books. So that's how they knew it was Edgar's. So my second question regarding pedigree is, again, with the label, are they noting all of this on that label, like on the back? They don't note it on the label, but they do note it on the website. So if you do get a pedigree book okay. where it tells you what pedigree it is, you can go and learn the story of the pedigree on CGC's website. As of this recording, there have been 28 known pedigrees, 29 now hmm. with the Promise Collection, I believe. I could be off by a few numbers there. The ground rules for a pedigree, it needs to be a one owner collection. It needs to be in really good shape. It can't be trash shape. And the collection has to to be before 1975. Are there pedigree books that are technically after? Yes, because they were part of the whole pedigree. Gotcha. Yeah, there are some pedigree okay. books that I think that were graded in the 80s and I think there actually may be a few in the 90s. Not many, I don't believe. The Ohio pedigree is a really fun story. Newport News is a really fun story. I've personally handled books from the Bethlehem pedigree. That one's really interesting. I don't want to butcher the name of this pedigree, but there was a woman who, when she was in the Japanese internment camps in the United States in the 1940s, she collected comics and she kept them mm. all. And so you got her story of her going through that camp and the thing that kept her going were these comics. So to get the story behind the book, of course, adds to the value of the book. So right. with these numbers that I was just shooting out of what these books are going for on Heritage from the Promise Collection, if they weren't a pedigree, maybe knock 20% off. It's probably about that much. That's a big percent though, especially when you're talking sometimes Hundreds of six thousands digits. Of dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty nuts, though. Things we will never own. I mean, you're not super into the history of the hobby. You're not super into the history right. of comics. You enjoy no. it. You enjoy comics for what they are. This is cocaine to golden age oh, comics I can imagine. And, yeah. and whatnot. Some of these pedigrees have some very, very interesting stories. The Promise Collection tugs at your heartstrings, kind of. So if you're ever bored and you want to know more about pedigrees, CGC has a list of them and you can click on them and you can learn the whole story of where these books came from. It won't give you a list of what the books were. You'll have to find that on your own. The only one that was super well cataloged was the Edgar Church because it was Chuck Radansky pulling out hundreds of thousands of comics in perfect shape. And so they wow. kept track of them all. Can you imagine being that person that's like, what did I just find? <laughs> the worst part about it is, so Edgar Church was going to throw these books away. He called <laughs> four people and they didn't want to look at them. So he called Chuck Radansky and if Chuck didn't come by Sunday, he was going to throw them all away. And when Chuck showed up, Edgar said, you have to take everything on the floor before you get to the closet. And Chuck was so confused. And when he went downstairs and he saw all these comics stacked basically six feet tall and saw what they were and how incredible they were, he's like, what the fuck is in this closet? You had Detective 27, Action Number 1, Batman mm. Number 1, wow. Red Raven Number 1. There's only 12 copies known to exist. All these books. And if this collection was found today, it'd be worth $4 billion. And I think he paid, I could be wrong with this number, but I think he paid 10000 for everything. But 10000 in mean, 1974 is a lot of money. It was, yeah, a substantial amount of money for sure but still wow maybe i'll look at those little emails just keep a little track it's, it's pretty interesting <laughs> it, is, it is just super interesting to watch um, and with that our grab bag is complete yes thank um, you for listening if you don't subscribe please do so if you follow on tiktok follow elsewhere as well because tiktok might be going down we don't know <laughs> panelist podcast panelist podcast
That's a fantastic question. We should Google real quick. We really that. should. <laughs> Hold on. Nightwing 105 art. Oops, 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 oops. Can I get to it before you? 